So Shadow of the Colossus came out on PS4 recently, and I really just wanted to talk about why this game means so much personally to me. So much has been said about Shadow of the Colossus and its storyline. Its human themes have been analyzed and reanalyzed over and over again since it was first was released. Theories have been put forth and argued over by its fans. Secrets have been discovered, and now they're made anew once more with this remake. When I originally wrote on Shadow of the Colossus for the PS2, I attempted to encapsulate the crux of the matter thusly. During the course of the story, as Wander's hunt intensifies, there is a looming sense of dread, and not merely because our hero's appearance begins to diminish. There's a sense in which what Wander is doing is illegal, unethical, wrong, however you want to slice it, truly forbidden. Is it really worth the price Dorman warned of? Can you be sure that the entity will indeed hold up its end of the bargain? Would the woman be happy once revived if she knew the bloodshed that was accomplished? Should a human being be able to really tamper with powers of life and death beyond our control as a race? Is Wander's quest a noble one or more akin to witchcraft? As Wander cuts them down one by one, a thematic paradox occurs. Despite the massive and terrifying forms of the Colossi, it increasingly feels as if they are prey and Wander is their predator. It feels as if they are innocent creatures somehow, trapped within malignant appearances. Many of them seem like giant, gentle animals until provoked. And the more human ones can seem truly human. When wounded, some of them cry like whales, like living things experiencing an agony they don't understand. They still seem helpless against Wander's ancient sword, struggling to beat him back or shake him off. Who then is the real monster? Is this simply a task to complete, or is it murder? Not until the final tragic scene of the game's excellent and moving story comes full circle is the truth finally revealed, and even then, its poetic justice is open to interpretation. Our English word monster comes from an old French word denoting a malformed creature afflicted with a birth defect. Through no fault of their own, monsters in this definition are repulsive, not necessarily by deed, but by appearance. Taking the etymology back further to Latin, you find a word which means an object of dread, a divine omen, a portent, an abomination, from a root word which means to warn. In the ancient world, the appearances of strange animals were regarded as supernatural signs. An operative word here would be perception. The monsters, the Colossi of Shadow of the Colossus, are easily perceived as objects of dread until the slow surprise occurs wherein they almost appear to be victims to the player on the irresistible march toward their complete genocide. I was a different man when I wrote about those themes of the reversal of villainy in Shadow of the Colossus, and since then I've had the opportunity to continue to reflect upon the story. Far from familiarity breeding contempt, further playthroughs of this game, including this remake, have made the story even more personal to me. If I had to boil the entire quest down to one word, I might say obsession. I think that's what Shadow of the Colossus is essentially about. Wander's obsession to go to any length, violating social, cultural, and religious taboos and laws, and taking the lives of potentially innocent creatures to get what he wants most. That greed drives the game and inhabits the player as you're forced to step into Wander's shoes by the very nature of vanquishing the Colossi and doing Dorman's dirty work. Why does this resonate even more strongly with me now? Back in August of 2017, I happened across reading an article at Polygon called Why I Worship Crunch, which further cemented my distaste for the online publication. This is a piece tackling This was a piece tackling an admittedly controversial subject, which was met with swift and decisive backlash from the online gaming world. The response to the article from those who read it was so powerful, in fact, that the writer felt it was necessary to update his work with a preamble, setting the piece in a much more redemptive light, despite the ugly title. When I read it, I understood it as advocating for an extremely unhealthy, physically, emotionally, and socially unhealthy methodology for work. 
I didn't pick up on much redemption either. It seemed to me that the author championed harmful and reprehensible practices, all for the sake of putting out a video game. Normalization of the crunch isn't necessary when it's likely a management issue, beyond of course what seemed to be this developer's singular obsession with it. In my response article, No, Don't Worship the Crunch or Why Health, Love, and Life Matter, I did more than assault what I perceived to be a terrible, unhealthy, and immoral advocacy. I demonstrated how I had allowed myself to be sucked into the crunch as well. Since beginning my work with the Well-Read Mage, I've had late nights. I've seen the return of heart palpitations I suffered with in more stressful work years. I've wrestled with managing healthy sleeping habits. And most importantly of all, I've watched my children grow up from some regrettable distance. Neglecting my own family for the sake of my hobby and loving it would be truly evil. And that's the danger of obsession. I'm not the hero of my own story. Like Wander, I too have my own colossi to tear down, though. Creating and sustaining a YouTube channel, managing and editing submissions by contributors, growing my influence and impact on social media, creating new avenues through podcasting, merchandise, audio reviews, radio, illustration, photography, and all the other imaginings I may have. These giants are in themselves good and innocent, roaming free. But if I attack them only in the mad and single-minded obsession with whatever it is I'm trying to actually do all this for, ignoring the facts of life and death and my own health, ignoring the precious social fabric which largely depends on me and my own immediate family, ignoring the years of my kids' youth which none of us will ever see again, then I risk becoming just like Wander. I risk becoming inhabited by the darkness of Dorman, a plurality of voices promising what I could only dream of. I risk becoming a monster in my own home with mounting impatience and anger if my aspirations aren't met. My subjective interpretation of Shadow of the Colossus is that it is a cautionary tale. It is a warning sign against kneeling at the altar of Dorman, where once Satan himself might have intoned the sermon, all this I will give you if you'll only fall down and worship me, that ancient temptation to do evil to reach the good. Shadow of the Colossus reminds me that if I don't want to become the screaming, helpless, ineffective man-child that Wander becomes at the end of the game, that I've got to flee from blind obsession and vain ambition. Life is about so much more than that. What isn't included in Shadow of the Colossus is the gift of joy. Consider, Wander wanted to bring the girl back to life, whoever she was, but he was bringing her back for him for his obsession, not for her. Her own memory stained with the blood of the Colossi and Wander rendered her burden in the end. No thank you.